24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Phonic FM. Exodus Sound Alternative. This is Phonic FM. You're listening to the Britpop Revival Show. That was Salad and Granite Statue. And uh, thank you to uh, Carl Bridges for suggesting that. Before that one, we heard Shine by the Montrose Avenue. And uh, thank you to uh, Matt Everett for suggesting that, uh, which is just as well because uh, Matt's on the line. Hello, Matt. <laughs> is it, are you allowed to suggest your own song? Does that seem like a little bit egomaniacal? Yeah, well, is it all right, I think? Oh, we like a bit of ego. That's fine, yeah. No yeah, problem, no that problem that with thing? that. Is that the thing when you see people in a band wearing their own band T-shirt and you're like, can you? some people can get away with it, some can't. I think that's it's something that splits people, I think, isn't it? I, I'm fully expecting you to be wearing a Montrose Avenue T-shirt <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> I wish, um, have I got any... I don't know if, I, if I've got a couple left. I think my mum's probably got a few in the garage as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to think that that's actually true. It's probably, probably. Is. <laughs> you will. Yes. Yeah. No. I'm doing well, and uh, and thank you so much for 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 joining us. And yeah, from for someone from the UK's second best radio station to <laughs> to come on to Phonic FM is uh, uh, is, is is great. Um, so. For um, anyone who hasn't been tuned in or uh, has been under a rock somewhere. Uh, Matt Everett, kind of a life in Britpop and then a life after it, um, and and so much to talk about. So well, let's, let's kind of dive straight in, if we can. Um, as a young man, you came straight into menswear out of nowhere <laughs> and just bang hit the Britpop scene. You know, if you ask people to name Britpop bands, you know they're going to go Oasis and Blur and Suede and Pulp, and then they're going to go menswear because you are synonymous with it. How on earth yeah. did that happen? I, it's interesting, isn't it? It's, I think it's kind of almost brilliant that it sort of happened so quickly and then sort of collapsed so quickly. There's almost something quite noble about that. I mean, all the other bands that you just mentioned had kind of esteemed careers, and a lot of them had careers before they got famous. You know, I mean, Pulp and, and Blur and Supergrass and all those guys kind of sort of... Put, put, built up to fame and we just kind of sort of rugby tackled it to the floor drunkenly <laughs> rugby tackled it to the floor without really knowing. I mean I joined I've been in bands and stuff in Birmingham where I come from for like years and years and I sort of moved to London when I was 18 or was it 10, 18 and a friend of mine had, had sort of said oh there's this band in, I used to hang about in Camden a lot but it was the kind of the scene that celebrates itself and when you used to go to Syndrome's and uh, and the underworld in Camden there was like Swerve Driver and Orange Deluxe and, all, and Eat and all those kind of bands were around that kind of pre brit pop scene and uh, Suede just sort of started coming through and, and oh, oh there's this there's this band there's this band that needs a drummer you should, um, you should go and audition them um, you know sort of meet them and audition them and they've all got names that are names that are born to be in a band there's uh, Johnny Dean is a singer I was like what's a ridiculous name that's not it's got, it's got to be made up um uh, you know, Chris Gentry, it's a brilliant name, the band's called Men's World. I thought, this has got to be ridiculous, this is just sounds too perfect. And I went to one rehearsal, and then, um, I think they had like two or three songs, and we played them, and I remember getting a lift back from Stuart, the bass player, to my, to my house in North London, and he was saying, we are going to get signed, you know, we, we are going to get signed to a major label. And I was like, really? Is, is it that easy? I've been in bands for years, and no one would even ever come and see my rubbish band, uh, even the less rubbish ones. But um, yeah, it, it, and then after it, it was like somebody put the brick on the accelerator, and it happened very, very quickly indeed. The first show we did, we had to do it under a different name because people wanted to sign us before we'd even played. <laughs> and well, yeah, and it's, I, and it's sort of got from there. Really. I, I didn't know that you had to do your first gig under a different name yeah, because of all the A yeah. and R men trying to. Yeah, it was. It was the and, and still some found out it was the Amsterdam Arms in New Cross. I think it's still there. God, I sound like some old... I think it's still there back in the day. It was in 94. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then the second gig... The second gig that we did was in a nightclub that was run by our manager. And then it all sort of it kicked off. I think we had... We had three songs, I think. Maybe four. For that first... Those first two gigs. Maybe maybe one more. Which were the first songs that we did. And those are the first songs that we kind of demoed for record labels. I think they were the first three singles as well, which I'm easily proud of. <laughs> uh, that, that's, an, that's an incredible ratio. <laughs> Not bad, is it? No, but I mean, yeah, you know, there's, yeah, we were we were exceptionally competent. I mean, we were bratty, it's got to be said. But I think maybe 
maybe that was part of the appeal. That it all looked, it made it look really, we thought it was really easy. But it did seem at the time very, very easy. Well, it, it must have seemed that way. You know, if you're, um, you know, if, I mean, most bands, you know, first gigs, uh, you know, they're lucky if they get their mums to come to it, you know? Um, yeah. And you, you've, you're being courted right from the start. Um, famously on top of the pops before you've released anything yeah uh, you know a, a huge well a relatively huge uh record deal when you've got you've still got single digit number of songs mm-hmm. you must have just thought you could do anything yeah it, it was i mean we went i was still i was at art school before the band got signed and i remember being flown to new york a manager who was great actually and sort of kind of studied definitely at the malcolm mcleod school of management was like right uh, if we want to sign this band, then we have to go and meet your American counterparts. We have to go and meet the record label in New York, not, not just in London. So we would be flown out to New York first class. So uh, one record label did that. The other record label that wanted to sign us in the States uh, put us up in this hotel with limos and stuff, and all expenses paid. <laughs> and, and I was there, like, like sort of going to art school in the morning and then flying off to America to be treated like, you know, a pop star. It was very strange. It was brilliant. But I think yeah, that was, this was, I guess this was the thing, because it seemed so incredibly easy, and it happened very, very quickly, we kind of assumed it was that easy, always. And it's not. Being a band is a lot more difficult than that. And I think we sort of underestimated how difficult the sort of music and the work part of the band was. But we were very good at looking good and going to parties and having fun stuff. We were great at that. Uh, you, 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 you certainly were. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, I mean, ahead of uh, ahead of talking to you today, I went back and, and listened to when we had Johnny Dean on the show, which uh, oh, Johnny, which, which remarkably was f- four years ago now. So uh, how how that happens, I've no idea. Um, but you, Johnny. there was there was something that, that stood out from, from what he said. He said, "When you're in a band, you're in a state of permanent confusion. But when your management are too, you're um, in a pickle." He said, "So he didn't say you're in a pickle." Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel that, that um, is, is that right? That sounds about right. I think, for the, yeah, for the reasons that I mentioned when, like, uh, Blur had been recording for a while before they got very famous. Not that we ever compared ourselves artistically to Blur, because I don't think we were really ever on that level. Or, and Pop of a very long time. You kind of, you've, you've learned quite a lot. You've learned how it works. You've maybe been through some of your scrapes. Maybe you've kind of, overindulged here and there a bit and come out the other side of it and you kind of realise, you know, that, that it takes a lot of a lot of smarts and a lot of awareness to kind of get to where you want to be in a band, you know? It, it, it takes a lot of uh, songwriting, now and development. You've got to, it's, it's, you know, you want to be a good band and that just doesn't happen very easily. I think we felt it all happened very easy and then kind of chaos ensued. You've also got to remember how much money was flushing around the record business at the time. Mm. I mean, everybody was having a very good time. Everybody. I mean, the bands were, the promoters, <laughs> the marketing people, the A&R people, the management, everybody was really enjoying themselves on a grand scale. Um, you know, like, I mean, scared, mind you, always, everyone always says that, about, oh, the record industry in the 60s, you should have been there, and it was crazy. And everyone says, oh, in the 70s, my God, it was it was incredible. The 80s, my God, the 80s were wild. And the 90, they, I think the record industry generally is just like that quite a lot of the time. Maybe now it's sobered up a little bit over the past 10, 15 years. But yeah. then, yeah, so everybody was having a good time. Records were selling in enormous numbers. It's very easy to get on the radio if you're a young band, which is brilliant. That was kind of one of the good things about Britpop, I guess, was that if you had a decent song, you could get it heard. And people would turn up and take your band out on the strength of a little review somewhere in the NME or the Melody Makers. So there was, it was quite a vibrant thing, but with that does come, I mean, there's a grain of truth in what Johnny said. There was a certain amount of confusion uh, everywhere you went. But the momentum, I think, of the band carried it forward. And some of the songs were all right, you know? We did some good stuff. Well, I, I still believe. I still believe. Do you know what? I, th- I think that um, menswear have been uh, much maligned unfairly because <laughs> if you go back and listen to Nuisance right there are some good songs on that album it's that not up. bad it's not bad that record I mean it's terribly produced we did it I mean the amount of money we spent on that record you would not believe we we recorded it at Peter Gabriel's got this amazing studio Peter Gabriel Peter like so Sledgehammer yeah. Gabriel yeah. has got this incredible studio 
in Bath called Real World. And it's huge. It's a residential studio. Where you sort of move in and you live, and there's vast rooms and studios, and there's a wine cellar, which is a stupid idea, and um, all these different writing rooms and huge solid wood echo chambers and pianos and stuff. And for some reason, we decided to go there to do the record. And we just, I mean, it must have cost thousands and thousands of pounds a minute. And we just fannied about. We invited people from the local village to come and have parties. We just got, you know, concentrated on getting smashed and sleeping in late and raiding the wine cellar rather than actually trying to perform good songs. And yeah, so it's a miracle it got made at all. And it doesn't, say, it doesn't sound like a million dollars, but it probably <sighs> cost it. Okay. But, yeah, there is some good... There, there's some stuff on there that I am still really, really fond of. There's oh. some stuff that don't really stand up, but well, you know. Well, really. which which ones are you really fond of? Because I've I've got Nuisance in the CD drive here. Okay. And as long as you don't um, pick Stardust, which has got a rude word in it, then uh, it has, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's. Well, we did Stardust on top of the pops. We smashed all our equipment up <laughs> in an act of spontaneous rebellion. <laughs> but the cameras didn't catch it properly, so we had to do it again. <laughs> which kind of takes the whole <laughs> take two on spontaneity. The whole punk rock thing out of it, doesn't it? Um, play the one. No one ever plays that. It's got great strings in it. I can't remember the, the name of the guy who did the string arrangements, but um, he was great. And yeah, it's 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 a deep cut. That's what they say in America, isn't it? Of like, yeah, this is like a, an album deep cut. All oh, right. Okay. So stay with us, Matt. Um, I will. We are going to play the one by Menswear, and we will <laughs> back after that with more from Matt Everett. That is The One by Menswear, and uh, we are still here with Matt Everett, once of that band. Matt, that's a damn <laughs> that, that, decent song. I mean, right, OK. I'll, I'll give you that the chord sequence is Another Girl, Another Planet by The Only One. That I'll give you, <laughs> right, OK. I'm not going to I'm not going to contest that. But that's not bad, that, is it? I mean, come on. I mean, I'm not saying we were the greatest band of all time, but that's, that's, quite, that's quite a punchy little number, I think. But, do you know what I mean yeah there's some places where you might have to try and justify menswear on this show <laughs> you don't have to try and justify menswear mate you know we're, we're, we're in your corner place. this is a safe place yes. hello my name's Matt Everett I used to be in a bit pop band you all sort of sit in a circle is it like a sort of like a safe place we can talk about Brit pop with, uh, with pride rather than embarrassment that's fine it's yes. fine yes <laughs> Absol- absolutely right well we left menswear right at the peak you're playing Glastonbury, you're on the front <laughs> covers of all the magazines, you're having hit after hit with, you know, the, the only songs you've written. <laughs> um, and it's, actually, it's, it says here on Wikipedia, so it must be true, uh, yeah. you had a £500,000 publishing deal despite having only seven songs. Yeah, never saw that. I don't know where that went. <laughs> um, which is, I, I, I'm assuming that some of the other people who've spoken to this show may say a similar thing yes Where indeed money go um yeah it, it, it it was brilliant it was it was an incredibly enjoyable ride it was an awful lot of fun um it got a bit frazzling but then again yeah i mean like, this is you know if you're if you're 19 20 years old and everything's happening really easy to you and you've got free access to anything you want and you're traveling the world and people are telling you you're, you're brilliant that will that will skew with your mind a little bit if you haven't got it bolted on properly yeah. i think i mean yeah I, I i don't think we were really we weren't ready for it we weren't ready for it i remember doing you know we met some really lovely bands but some lovely people some of whom i know i'm still friends with today i remember doing a tour of the states with the charlatans and everybody going completely loopy absolutely like but tim burgess wore a dress for three days um, I remember that. Um, <laughs> and like just being this sort of crazy cabin fever thing. I've been to around America and just, just living in this sort of, sort of bubble of like gig and then party and then gig and then party and then gig and then party. And you know, um, and you had to speak to your mum for weeks, to paraphrase Guy Garvey. Um, and it, it, it becomes quite, quite, a weird, quite a weird lifestyle. I'm certainly not complaining about it, but I don't think it's necessarily very good if you haven't had a bit of grounding first and we certainly had absolutely no grounding we had no scaffolding we were very much a badly supported shed so it was so probably to get, <laughs> yeah yeah no surprise when that shed started to fall apart in that case exactly and when it went monkey it went flat yeah uh that that, that certainly happened <laughs> yeah. so so how how did your exit from the band happen i was there was uh what happened how did it start it was, it's, 
the idea of actually having to write a second album became like quite pressing um, and the songs weren't particularly forthcoming and the tensions within the band when things all of a sudden what's going right this is a kind of new thing for the band you know and then it's uh, this person takes out that person this person takes out that person it's your fault that you know my life's a mess because you did a tambourine wrong and all that kind of stuff all those cliches they're not like musical differences but certainly people were getting on really really badly and I think I I was the kind of was, was it a catalyst? No. Or was it a scapegoat? I don't know. People weren't getting on, and maybe I was one of the people that wasn't getting on with more than, more people than anybody else, if that makes sense. So I was sort of unceremoniously hoofed out the band, uh, which was pretty awful at the time, to be totally honest. It kind of felt like the rug had been pulled from underneath me, uh, and followed a sort of rather, rather undignified legal battle between me and the rest of the band to kind of, you know, extricate myself from the deal and the publishing deal and all that kind of stuff and uh, all that sort of thing and then yeah they sort of cut adrift and then <laughs> and I don't mean this in any uh, cruelness to, to Johnny or Chris or Simon or uh, Stuart uh, but it was quite satisfying watching the band go down the crapper after I left that was quite nice I don't mean that in an unpleasant way, but at the time it felt pretty good. But that's kind of what happened. It was a second record that I did. We, we recorded a bunch of demos for it, and it came out only in Japan, which is like, it's even even better, isn't it? If you were going to write, if you are going to tick all the boxes... If, if you do your band, revenge fantasy on the band. Yeah, yeah. it's really like, like, they were picking Japan, their final record only came out in Japan. That's like a Spinal Tap line, isn't it? It's literally... So that record came out, and then, and then they sort of fell fell to pieces so I'm not saying I was a linchpin that held everything together mm. but no actually what I am saying the weird thing with bands as you probably know um, if you like music bands don't necessarily have to be friends to be good mm. you know the kind of chemistry between bands is quite unique isn't it you see some, some groups and it's if you take one corner of the table leg away the table falls over and sometimes it's not just about the playing sometimes it's about the kind of people that that they are that keep things together I don't know maybe I'm pontificating too much about a short-lived group with one album but um yeah it was quite nice to watch and fail though well, yeah. yeah well that's a band that was kind of yeah it was almost destined to burn briefly but exactly, brightly yeah. you know? I, I think i think um it's a bit like how and blade runner isn't it it's kind of it's it's almost better to do that to kind of implode in arguments and, and stupidness than to kind of slowly degenerate playing smaller and smaller venues to less and less interested people while the songs get less and less interesting and inspired and the whole thing sort of grinds to a halt. Much better to go out like a firework. Indeed. You yeah. know. And then, you know, people remember fireworks because they're pretty nice in the last rush on that night. That's very true. Very true. Now, just before we move on from menswear, um, yeah. I, I understand there was a period of time when the original lineup kind of, you, know, you kind of got back together in the same room talked about maybe doing something but it didn't quite oh, come together yeah what did johnny say about this i didn't hear his interview what was his take on it um i think he, all he's <laughs> all he said well you know there's no point we can play it again yeah um <laughs> yeah he, he just said that there maybe were some differences that were too big to be patched up I, that does sound quite dramatic doesn't it i think i don't know it was it was there was oh, a oh that's it that's it he said i can forgive but i can't forget that was it uh, oh, that's that's a good lead singer comment, isn't it? It was always good to work with that, Johnny. Um, I think there was a window that was going to happen. In fact, if, I'm, I'm, if I do remember correctly, Emily Edith from Glastonbury did say to us, look, this, like, if you get it back together again, you can come and do the other stage as a surprise guest. And there was a talk of, I'll oh, just get back together and do some gigs in Japan. And so we all sat on the table, and it was terrible. It was awful. We all just, we just didn't get on. It wasn't there. It wasn't that, and I think it's sort of part of me was like, oh, it's a bit of a shame, because it would have been a nice thing to have done, you know, I think it would have been nice to have had a bit of a, a hurrah, I mean, Simon and Chris from the band now manage other bands, people like Phoenix, and, you know, people like that have done very well, and Lemon Twig, so, you know, it could have been quite a well-run little experience, rather than the sort of symbolic nature of before, but, um, yeah, it, it's, everyone sort of, a lot of the old arguments surfaced. Yeah. And you're like, oh, God, do we have to do this again? I think Simon just walked out. I think Simon said, I'm just going to go for a wee and didn't come back. So, um, yeah. There you go. That, that, could, that could be menswear's epitaph. 
<laughs> Whip, whippersnatch and didn't come back. <laughs> yeah. it, okay. it, it, it's a shame. It's a shame. I think it would have been quite a fun thing to have done. I sort of joked at the time. You know, I was like, you know, it would have been interesting to sort of play the songs again and go out to Japan and play some dates in the UK. And I could, you know, and the kitchen needs doing up, so the money would have been useful. But <laughs> I think well, only took that quite seriously at the time. But anyway, just before go. you came on, you tweeted Emily Evis again, uh, <laughs> suggesting a Montrose Avenue uh, reunion for Glastonbury. So that, that takes us neatly on, and because we've been chatting for ages, I'm enjoying this too oh, much. God, sorry, we haven't we? Blimey. Yeah. Well, I, hey, I don't care. This is this is this is the joy of. Yeah, community radio yeah we could do it we could Me go on for hours on yeah. yeah yeah I don't know if anyone's listening but I'm enjoying it um, <laughs> so uh, yeah from from your time in menswear you then resurface as the drummer in the Montrose Avenue and and you're back in the charts again that's yeah you know that's impressive love Montrose Avenue like it's kind of I guess once again it's a cliche to have the one band that that, that may be didn't live up to the potential that it could have and that did very well then another band that really genuinely was brilliant and then nobody brought the record I loved Montez Avenue I, think I, I, I really enjoyed my time with them they were like a spectacular group of bands best, best three part harmonies like since you know Crosby, Stills and Nash incredible singers all the three guys that did vocals in the group I genuinely loved them it was a, it was a kind of a special thing but unfortunately in 1999 the UK wasn't that interested in West Coast American Birds and Crosby, Stills and Nash and Neil Young influenced music. We, we didn't turn up at the right time, I don't think. We weren't really, we weren't really in step with uh, what everybody else wanted. I remember uh, one of our singers, Scott, um, was six foot four, very imposing dude, still is actually, and um, sort of turning up in a cape to a company, you know, like the sort of 60s sort of policeman capes, a like, hugely imposing figure, and then just going, yeah, this, this isn't going to go on the chart show, this isn't going to work. You know, um, we were quite out of out of step, but very, very fond, very fond of the band. Yeah, it's not a bad record. Again, it's not a perfect record that Montrose Avenue album, but it's got some bangers on it. It has. In fact, do you know what? I, I don't know if you've ever uh, done this, but if you look on Amazon for it, you can because Amazon's been around for so long now. Uh, the reviews from people who bought it when it came out are still on there. Oh, what do people say? Do people because I like it, it, yeah. we had some hits off it, but the record didn't do that well. I think it made it the top forty, but didn't do that particularly well. All right, so we got like uh, here, we, here we go. A fantastic anthemic debut, really good. Oh. This is an album which is definitely worth having. The energy and power with which the Montrose Avenue have, have is criminally unrecognised, and I would recommend this album to anyone with taste. Yes, power. We harness power. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's still a little bit like. Like maybe one day, many years after I'm dead, like like people will, will rediscover this band and yeah. discover that I was in a genius group. Well, I don't right. think that will happen, but it's nice to see. You never know. I was got. Um, they promise much more from a band offering a fresh alternative to tired mainstream indie. Buy it, and then this is the one I like. Uh, where it says uh, a fantastic debut from so obviously underrated musicians. I look forward to the second with eager anticipation. I just thought, <laughs> I hope you're not still waiting, mate. <laughs> Seriously, mate waiting a very very long time oh in fact his, his email's on here so uh, yeah <laughs> and this is, this is public yeah. on Amazon Kenny Doc <laughs> McPherson at orange.net um, I don't think orange.net's still there otherwise we could have dropped him a line anymore, yeah at uh, uh, Virgin Free Net 126 <laughs> yeah sorry mate <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we so you, you never know fingers crossed we might get the Montrose Avenue at Glastonbury I, I, I mean they yeah we got back together once and that was great. We did like a Fleetwood Mac cover at a party, which is quite good fun. Um, but I don't know. I don't, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I'd, I'd still quite like to do it. I think it would be quite good fun. I think it would be quite good fun. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's kind of taken us through the 90s. You know, the Montrose Avenue, I'm guessing, were part of that great guitar band cull at... <laughs> you know? Probably it, quite a healthy cull, yeah. Probably quite a healthy cull, with the exception of like... I'd, I'm generalising again, sort of. That was, yeah, not not that many bands made made it through that. I mean, it was like sort of if the if the Britpop wars were like the First World War, we sort of made it through through that through the trenches and then got culled on the field as 2000s rolled into into view and the uh, and the Super Club etc. took over. So uh, you know, just leaving Gomez and Travis sort of standing looking shaky, you know, <laughs> yeah. in that era. 
Well, I mean, what's, what's yeah, one of the yeah. things which is, is quite telling is that we've, we've had uh, probably about four bands now who've, who've come on the show who recorded their debut album you know, in the late 90s and it mm. got canned and never released. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, which is such a shame. And, uh, and only now are they kind of getting the rights back and things and putting them out on the internet and stuff. So you're getting these new releases from 20 years ago. It's this weird kind of That's time nice. factual stuff. That's really nice, isn't it? Yeah, you know, there's, there's always good music out there somewhere. There's there always is. good stuff. Sometimes it doesn't get recognised. Sometimes it takes a while, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it, Montrose Avenue, time has yet to come. Let's just put it like <laughs> that. Time has yet to come. Yeah. It's yet, just as I say, like when, when it's time to do that, Eight DVD anthology box set, you know. Just I'm, I'm ready. Let's do it. I sure I can find some ticket stubs and an old T-shirt in my mum's garage. That's we well. Make it happen. It's the standard way. It's the, um, <laughs> so after Montrose Avenue, you, you, you come out of performing entirely and move into music journalism, radio, and you've gone on to create this, uh, this really yeah, amazingly interesting career across a, a number of different. Uh, uh, Avenues. To, uh, what a choice of word. Um, yeah, do, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I mean, I mean, I I got into it because I know there there wasn't an, a, an awful amount of work for um, ex Britpop and late nineties uh, band drama of modicum of ability. So yeah, but I'd, I'd always remember I just really wanted to get into journalism. I just I still loved music despite everything. I still loved it and I wanted to write about it. And I thought I'd provide an interesting opinion when it came to sort of reviewing stuff which is what I started to do and then interviewing bands that's really that's really what what I fell in love with was the actual with doing interviews with people so I worked for a London indie radio station called X10 it's now called Radio X be very well and then leapt over to Six Music after doing that for about five years and yeah and Six Music kind of gave me the opportunity to make documentaries and talk utter balls in the morning with Sean Keaney on the breakfast show which is something I love dearly but also you know the do interviews with musicians that I really love and people that I really admire. That's that's kind of that's my thing now. That's what makes me enormously happy, and I love doing. And sort of you know these these people are really important, aren't they? You know they, they certainly are. I mean the the list of people you have interviewed is. Uh, I mean, the, basically the only person you've not interviewed is Elvis, and you've got a pretty good excuse there. Yeah, he's dead. Uh, that's breaking music news. You can have that. <laughs> you can have that. Elvis is dead. Yeah, it, it's. It's staggering. I, I do feel incredibly lucky to do, because the first time series is a series that I do on six, where I can interview different people. We're doing a book, actually, which is quite good. There's a book, as a later this year, there's a first time book, like 40 of some of the biggest interviews I've done, which is coming out. Oh, I have to come on again and talk about it. Um, and I I, I've looked back at that, and it's like, it is amazing. I feel, I feel blessed. That is Helplessly Hoping by the Montrose Avenue. Future hit, definitely there. Um, <laughs> Matt, I mean, you're like, back. I, I, I'm not mistaken. That's a banger, isn't it? That's a good tune. Oh, and there's, yeah, fantastic harmonies. Tune. Thank you. Yeah. One day, one day, as I say. One day. One day some, we'll get the recognition. Some <laughs> film's going to pull that in a soundtrack and, and you'll be away again. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, before we got uh, rather unceremoniously cut off there, those first-time interviews are uh, just a... If, if, if listeners haven't heard those, uh, we'll tweet out the, the link. Some of them are still available uh, on iPlayer and stuff. Uh, just a fantastic trove of information from a wide range of, of, of I mean, music legends, really, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I think well, this is the, the idea was to do something that, that would that would kind of exist forever sounds very portentous doesn't it but like yeah, I, think, I, I think these people are really important I think they've changed culture they've changed how we think about you know these musicians how we think about love and family and, and, and dancing in the world and politics and everything and so to have like this sort of archive of them uh, there to listen to forever because they're not time sensitive they're not like tell us about your latest record or like hey what do you think about what happened last week it's all kind of like these what what made you who you are you know, your first gig your first single the first time you felt this the first time you met your heroes so yeah as I say it's um the book will be good I think the book will be great I'm kind of really pleased that it's nearly done yeah. it's going to be out in November so as I say we'll have to come on and talk about it a bit more when it's ready but yeah it's 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 an honour it's an honour it is amazing to meet these people you know it's great. Yeah. Well, like you say, they're they're, um, they're they're fantastic pieces of work, and I would encourage anybody to oh, to you. go out and, and listen to those. And also, I, I caught up; uh, I'd, I'd missed it when it first came out. On your uh, history of the music business, that was fascinating. 
Oh, yeah, that was a thing for Radio 4, wasn't it? Yeah, that was kind of like how things went horribly wrong. What did they? Um, yeah, the sort of emergence of the, uh, the pirates, the, the, the music industry pirates and the rise of the MP3, and then how we're kind of the situation we are with streaming now, which is essentially pretty good. I mean, I think, I know, Spotify and some of those services seem to get a bit of a bad rap sometimes from some corners of the industry, but partly just thinks, what, £9.99 for all the music in the world? That's not bad, is it? Let's be honest. No. So, no. you know, I, I think, and there's exposure for people that would normally get exposure. So I think, you know, the future is always a little bit scary sometimes, but I think it's exciting. More, you can hear more music than you ever could before from more people. And essentially, I think that's a good thing. That, that's true. And I think what's, what strikes me is that kind of back, cat, not the back catalogues, but, but previous eras music is now available in, in a way that it, you know, uh, when I was a kid, um, you know, you didn't hear old music. Mm. Yeah anywhere because you know you you were just tuned into radio one that just played those tracks and and that was it you were actually fed quite a narrow diet um but whereas now people bemoan that kind of concentration of culture but actually it, it's allowed a, a such a broad range to to flourish on its own terms especially yeah, for independent yeah, artists yeah. You know, i think there's also there's this thing about it and i think you get this a lot with you know social media in general um, little niches, little niches of interest and pockets and of passion, but actually spread that globally. Those are those are thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Those little niches. There's a lot of people that feel the same, like your show. You know, there's, there's lots and lots of people that, that feel the same way that you do about the music that you play. And now you can get in contact with them, they can hear you, and you can share the stories and share music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, right, Matt, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. It's been fantastic to talk to you, um, and and to cover such a, a, a wide range of, of, of everything, really. So uh, yeah, it's not bad. It's my life in thirty-five minutes. Yeah, it's my musical life in thirty-five minutes. Yeah. Uh, well, um, listen. When the first time comes out in September, uh, it would be fantastic if we get you back on and, and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, awesome. That'd be great. I'd love to. And uh, and I'm sure people will uh, will hear you in the morning. Yeah, good luck, man. It's a love. Oh. <laughs> well, okay. Do you know what? We'll take that. That's a positive note to leave on. Uh, next up, it's the Wanna Dies.